reminded me about uh, that um, old story, a certain white and the seven war. Do you remember that? Uh, you probably remember reading it. Uh, maybe some of you remember watching it, right? The old uh, Disney movie. Um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and, and, and no one can argue that Snow White's stepmother, who was that evil queen, right, uh, that uh, she, uh, no one can argue that she didn't really have a, a healthy ego, right, she was pretty secure uh, in and of herself, right, uh, um, and day after day she kind of boldly and she confidently would step before that mirror, right, uh, she'd step before that mirror and she'd ask, Mirror, you can say it with me, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, right? And every morning, right, you remember this, every morning the mirror would, you know, uh, concur that she indeed was the fairest of them all. Uh, that was the image that was reflected of that, was the most beautiful image in the kingdom, the most beautiful image in the land. It's not that one faithful morning that she goes to her mirror, mirror on the wall, and she asks the question once again, uh, but instead of answering the question with the usual, you are my queen, uh, you are the fairest in the land, my queen, what was the answer that she got that day? Snow White, right? It was Snow, Snow White. The wicked queen's own image had not changed, right? She was still looking in the mirror, that image uh, had not changed, uh, but the mirror's reflected perception of her had changed. That's interesting, isn't it? That truthful, if tactless, mirror found someone more beautiful to reflect in the mirror. And so now the so-called queen was the second best, fairest in the land. Now, very few of us, uh, at least if you're like me, very few, uh, few of us uh, like to run and look at ourselves in the mirror the first thing in the morning, like uh, you know, like the Snow White stepmother did, right? Uh, you would think that after a good night's sleep, that our face would be worth a million dollars, but it's not. It's, it's worth about twenty-nine cents. I think. I think when I look at my face in the morning, maybe not even. Maybe it'll go for a quarter, maybe, 25 cents. Uh, uh, but uh, we don't necessarily like to look in the mirror first thing in the morning, do we, right? It's kind of scary. You probably look more like that uh, market uh, demoniac that uh, Jesus casts out this unclean, unclean spirit from. But have you ever noticed that when no one is looking, if we pass by a mirror, it's, it, we're tempted to take a look, aren't we, right? I mean, how, how many of you actually pass by a mirror? Even when there are people around you, just take a slight glance, you know, just, you know, just to make sure your zipper's not down, right? Or to make sure, you know, your hair is straight, uh, make sure that you look okay. I mean, we, we want to take a look, don't we, when we walk, when we walk by a mirror. We want to take at least, at least a glance. So like the wicked queen in Snow White, we are drawn to our mirrors. We become mesmerized by what they say to us and what those mirrors say about us. Unfortunately, for most of us, what we think we hear our mirrors telling us is far from being the fairest of them all. Instead, we oftentimes hear a thousand judging voices at us, right? Voices that come to us from our early childhood, through our adolescence, even through our adults telling us that, you know, that we're fat and we're frumpy and that we're failures. That is sometimes those images that, that, that we see in the mirror tell us those, those most difficult things. And many of us are still looking in childhood mirrors or adolescent mirrors or even adulthood mirrors or, or even a hall of mirrors. So as Mark, uh, the Gospel writer, carefully records much of what Jesus did in his ministry was to bring about healing to others. And a lot of that healing was physical healing, right? I mean, Jesus cured people of fevers. Jesus cured people of their blindness. Jesus cured crippled limbs and deafness and, and bleeding. Jesus did all of, of these physical healings. 
But also in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is about spiritual cleansing as well. Jesus is about healing our spiritual side, not just our physical side. It was an unclean spirit that Jesus cast out of this demon in the Gospel of Mark. So this story has to do with our spirituality. So what is the health of our spirituality? Now, when we gather to have a meeting, and particularly at this time of year, our January meeting, we get all those great reports of numbers, right? Uh, we get the great reports, and, and that's the first thing that we look at, right? When we turn to the annual report, we, we want to see how we ended the year, what were our financial numbers, right? And, and then what are the numbers that are going to require us to go into the new year, right? We focus on the numbers. Or we, we think about the numbers uh, that are involved, that are engaged, our membership numbers. Sometimes we focus on that, so we'll we'll turn to that membership page and we'll we'll see how many. And actually, I'm going to probably do that for you today. Look at how many baptisms we had and how many deaths that we that that we had uh, this past year and how many new members that we brought into our fellowship this year. So we we look at the numbers and it's, it's easy to look at. Numbers. Right? I mean, I mean, we have a beautiful big sanctuary, we have a beautiful worship space, and we have a big God, and there's always room for more, right? Do you think we could fit a few more people in our uh, sanctuary, in our worship space? Of course we could, right? But in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus really doesn't bring up numbers that often. What he does bring up is our spirituality. So that's the question before us, or at least that's what I want you to think about today. How is your spirituality? And how would you rate that? I think that uh, that's the question. The top of Jesus' list in Jesus' plan is not our numerical growth, but the top in Jesus' list is our spiritual growth. How are you, how am I growing spiritually? Not more people, but more faithfulness to Jesus Christ. More faithfulness to what Jesus is calling us to be in this life. So we want as a congregation to become committed in everything we do to make sure that our lives, that, that your life, and that my life are always moving, that we're always uh, moving ahead, moving towards the image of God that we see in the life and the faith of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to be a congregation committing to making sure that no life, no member's life, no community person's life, no pastor's life is stuck or stagnant, but that life is always growing, growing towards Christ and the image that God would want to have us see when we look in the mirror. That's spiritual growth. You know, when I look back over my life, some of the memories that bring me the greatest joy are the moments that I can pinpoint in which something happened or someone said something to me that helped me to grow. Something happened to me or somebody said something that helped and led me to grow. And you can do the same also in your life. The time when kind of the lights went on in your head in some way, shape, or form and, and that your life moved forward uh, that your life turned a corner or, or something happened and then you felt that you weren't stuck. Something in your life that happened that you felt that you weren't stagnant anymore. And I think uh, uh, back, uh, particularly, particularly to the time when I went to the seminary, and I was just at the seminary for three days this past week, so whenever I go back, I always start to reminisce. That's what old people do, I guess. It's, you know, when we go back and start thinking about the good old days. Well, that's what I'm doing. Uh, but I still remember when I entered the seminary into the master's program, now some 26 years ago, 
I, I remember how scared I was. And I remember walking into my first class, which was an introduction to Greek class. Have you ever heard the word, well, that's Greek to me, right? What does that mean? I don't have a clue what's going on. You don't have a clue what's going on, right? So we say that. Well, I had to actually be in a Greek class, right? Where I had to learn what was going on. And, and, I, and I knew, I knew before I went into that class that if I did not pass Greek, I would not get through seminary because it was a requirement. So there I, along with our, my other students, we sat there scared as scared can be. And thinking that our professor would kind of calm our nerves uh, that first day, this is, this is what he said. He, he turned to us and he said, do not think that this course that you're about to enter will be a stroll through a meadow. Don't think that way, but think more that it's going to be a walk through a minefield, is what he said. So that helped us a lot, kind of calm our, our nerves. You know, he's staring at us at, in the eye, and we're all kind of you know, shriveling as we hear this. Because, like I said, if we don't get through Greek, you don't get through the seminary. It's as simple as that. So you had to get through Greek. And I remember that year, that first three months, probably was was the most growth that had ever occurred in my life. Because I was surrounded by people who helped me, and I was surrounded by, by good teachers. So we think now, and we put our minds around spiritual growth, right? Not numerical growth, but spiritual growth. How are you growing in the faith? That's the question. Now, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said this. He said, he said, far too many people think of Christians merely as people who ought to be nice. And generally, Christians aren't as nice as they ought to be. But when we think of Christians, we think of people that ought to be nice, right? He, he said that that's not what we should be thinking. Not that being nice isn't important. I don't think that's what C.S. Lewis was saying. And I'm looking out here, and I'm seeing a lot of nice people. You are very nice. But for C.S. Lewis, that great Christian thinker and writer, he said the point of Christian is not so much how nice we are, but how new we are. Not how nice we are, but how new we are. So how new are you? And how are you growing in your spiritual life? And we send our kids to Sunday school, and we think, that's great, they need to grow in the faith. Uh, we need, they need to learn the Bible, they need to be reading the Bible, they need to be start to, you know, they need to be taught the Bible. Well, how about the adults around us? Do you need to read the Bible? Do you need to know where Christ is calling you? Do you need to grow in the faith? It's not something like once we're confirmed, we're done growing, right? If we're not dead, we're not done, right? If we're done, then maybe we are dead. then maybe we are dead. But we're not done, so God always wants us to grow. Grow spiritually. So that's the question. What's more important than being nice is being made new and growing. So are you moving on? Are you moving towards Christ and Christ's image of you? Or are you stagnant and are you stuck? In the faith. And if you are stagnant and if you are stuck in the faith, then how do you become unstuck, right? How do you grow? How do you grow in the faith? And I suppose in some ways I've already provided one answer at least to that question. And that is simply this. If we're going to grow spiritually, if we're going to grow in the faith, if you want to grow in the faith, if you don't want to be stuck, then you definitely need other people to do that. Just like I need my classmates, and just like I need good teachers. We need other people to help us grow in the faith. Whether it's the professor I mentioned, or a teacher, or someone else, whoever it is, we need someone else to grow in the faith. We need other people coming into our lives. And sometimes it can be just our friends, and that's good. Sometimes they may be people in the pew sitting beside us that we need to grow in the faith. What if God has brought you all into the lives of other people so that you might grow spiritually? Think about it. All of you sitting here today, what if in this room all the resources were present for you to grow 
in the faith and to be made and remade in the image of Jesus Christ. So that if we interacted with each other just a little bit more than we presently do, if we came to know each other just a little bit more than we presently know each other, we would find out enough for each other to be inspired, to move on from where we are to where God wants us to be in this life. And we would find out enough for each other to be inspired, right? To be inspired, to grow spiritually. We need other people if we're going to grow. And while I believe God brings the right people into our lives just at the right time, I also believe that sometimes we pass by the very people we need without receiving the gift that they want to give us. Or sometimes we don't believe that we are the ones God wants to use to help somebody else grow spiritually. So how are you growing? That's the question. Spiritually. Now I, I should say I, we had a baptism the other day. And I had noticed when I took the baptismal flag out uh, of the cupboard, I noticed that it was all shining. I hadn't even noticed before until I saw this glimmer of shine uh, in the baptismal a flag of a picture that this flag of earlier had grown brown and dingy and dirty. And I didn't even notice it until it was all clean. Until it was clean. And so that the image that is reflected in here as, as I look at the it's a little distorted, but I can see myself in this image. And I think about when we baptize infants and how this, what this represents being washed clean spiritually in the waters of baptism. And how this calls us always to grow in the faith, to keep growing. Sometimes our image gets tarnished when we look into mirrors, doesn't it? And, and we don't even notice it. I wonder if that demonic from Mark, I bet you he looked in the mirror, if they had mirrors back then, and I bet you didn't even notice how distorted that he had become. But when Jesus cleansed him spiritually, I like to think of him looking in the mirror and just rejoicing and giving thanks to God. Because Jesus is the one that makes us new. Jesus is the one that helps us to grow spiritually. And Jesus calls the church to do the same. So how are you going to grow spiritually in this coming months and in this coming year? And how is the church going to help you do that? And more importantly, how are you going to help the person sitting to your right look at that person? And the person sitting to the left, God has given you that person to help them grow spiritually as well. Luther, Martin Luther said, it's, life is not so much righteousness, but it's growing in righteousness. Life is not so much health, but it is healing. Life is not so much being, but it is Becoming. So we're going to grow together, right? We're going to commit together, together to grow spiritually. Amen. And we'll stand together.